Okay, here we are. It's a presentation I'm going to give for the ICMI. And I thought I'd uh, do one spontaneously here and put it on the YouTube channel uh, for those who couldn't attend the ICMI. And we're going to start talking about um, testosterone. Because testosterone is um, highly masculine. <clears throat> it's what makes us men. At least a part of what makes us men. And so we need to learn about this thing called testosterone. And guess what? Men go through three floods of testosterone. The first flood happens in utero. A little teeny baby, right? I mean, a little teeny baby. See those nuts? That's the baby's about as big as one of those pecan nuts. It's tiny. And, you know, he's getting this flood of testosterone, which changes the brain. And it does a number of other things. One of the things it does is it changes or it impacts his gender identity. Whether he thinks he's a boy or a girl, this is huge. This is happening in utero. And remember, this all flies in the face of the whole socialization is everything team, you know, which is an absolute insane idea. But gender identity is one of the things that scientists know is impacted by this testosterone flow, whether you think you're a boy or a girl. Sexual orientation, whether you want to sleep with men or women, is also impacted by this flood of testosterone in utero. Amazing, right? I mean, that's huge. It changes your face. They know now that the more testosterone you get in utero, the more masculine your face is going to be. Isn't that interesting? So even women, you know, if they get more testosterone in utero, their faces are going to be more masculine. So there's all kinds of things that this flood in utero does that are absolutely amazing. You know, the one of the things that happened, <coughs> damn, excuse my coffin. One of the things that happened was that uh, Simon Baron Cohen thought about this whole thing with the testosterone flood in utero and, and the apparent differences that come out. And he went to, or they, they have these hospitals in Great Britain that saved the amniocentesis fluid, the little samples. And so Sarah, Simon Baron Cohen got these samples and tested for testosterone each of the samples, then connected with the real life boys and girls actually, who had these samples tested. And he started making some guesses about what this stuff does. And you know, it's fascinating stuff. I'd recommend you have it, check them out. But one of the things he talks about is the basic difference is the male brain becomes what he calls the systems brain a brain that's interested in systems, a brain that's interested in taking things apart, interested in what does one little piece do? How can I replace that? What can I do? You know, that's the whole systems thing, right? Whereas the female brain, he called a relational brain, more interested in relating, talking, things like that. So uh, now remember, the differences we're talking about here are not black and white. When we talk about differences in brain and the way people are, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's subtle. It's not, um, you know, one thing or the other. And if you look at this chart, you see this is a chart of men and women and their heights. You know, it's fairly safe to say most men are taller than most women, right? Yeah, but you can look at this chart and you can see, you know what? There are some pretty tall women who are almost as tall as some of the taller men. And there's some very short men who are also kind of shorter. In fact, if you look at the chart, they're shorter than the women. So this is not an all men do it this way and all women do it that way. There's lots of gray in the things that we're talking about here. So don't think that we're talking about something that's just, you know, binary. It's not. It's it's subtle. And it, But you can say most men are taller than most women. You look at someone who's 6'7", 6'8", 6 6 6 there's almost no women who are that tall. So... Generally, we can say it's true, but it's a lot of gray, and that's okay, you know? That's okay. One of the other things they found was aggression is impacted by this testosterone flood. Those who have more of the flood are probably going to be a little bit more aggressive. Now, this aggression was a little bit less than the, the height um, standard deviation. So, Aggression is, is not a huge factor, but if there's a, men are going to be a little bit more aggressive, particularly at younger ages. Um, the whole time 
this testosterone is flooding this little pecan-sized brain the whole time it's going on. It's doing what they call testosterone priming. That means it is literally priming the receptors in the brain for later um, activity via testosterone. So those who got this flood, those who got the testosterone priming, are going to be more reactive to testosterone later in life. Interesting, right? And oh, the play behaviors. is another thing they found that are impacted by this flood. Play behaviors. You know, boys and girls play differently. And let's look at some of the little ways they do that. You know, boys play as unique. Boys prefer trucks and girls prefer dolls, right? You know that. You probably know that since you were a little guy. But you know what? It's true. And they did research. And sure enough, they found that boys like the trucks and the girls like the dolls. But the socialization zealots came out and said, no, this is because they're socialized to like those toys. Hmm. So the researchers slowly went back and they, they started doing research on younger kids, three-year-old, two-year-old. Same thing. The boys like the trucks and the girls like the dolls. Hmm. Yeah, and the socialization zealot said the same thing. No, 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 no. Even at two, this could be socialization. <laughs> so the researchers didn't know what to do. But Melissa Hines, this wonderful researcher, decided, okay, I know what I'll do. She went to Vervet Monkeys. And she did the, she used the same toys with the Vervet Monkeys. And guess what she found? She found that the Vervet Monkey males like the trucks. And the vervet monkey girls like the dolls. Tell me about the socialization with that, right? So we pretty much know that it's, this is something that is impacted in utero and that boys are going to play differently than girls. They're going to like the trucks. The girls are going to like the dolls. By the time a boy is three years old, he prefers to play with boys. By the time he's five, it's a three to one ratio. Three hours boys, one hour girls. By the time he's eight, it's 11 to one. 11 to one. And guess what? The girls are not really into playing with boys either. They like to play by themselves. And the girls kind of have this personal play where it's kind of, um, they're, they're practicing parenting skills and cooking and things like that. That was what my daughter did. And she loved it. My son, he liked teams. He liked the teams. Coalitional play. Boys like teams. They like to learn how to play as a team, and all of these play things we're talking about is connected to that testosterone flood. At least a part of it is. We need a catcher. <laughs> you know, boys learn that if they want to be a part of the team, they've got to have a skill that the team needs. So I can remember, you know, the baseball team said, uh, we need a catcher. I said, I can play. I didn't know the first thing about catching. I'd never done it, but I'd learn real quick in order to be on the team. So boys learn how to get skills that are going to be valued by the team. And there's other things that boys learn. They learn to tolerate boys they don't like for the benefit of the team. I can remember that. You know, Jimmy can really play, but oh, he's a real prick, you know. <laughs> but it's okay, we'll let him play. We'll let him play because he's really good. You know, that's kind of the way guys are. Isn't that interesting? And I don't remember girls doing that. You know, girls tended to choose who they liked. The boys tend to choose the boys that are going to play the best, right? Now, flood number two, mini puberty. Right after the boy is born, he gets another flood of testosterone. They don't know as much about this one because it really, they, I think they've just started studying it more in the past five years or so. But they do know a couple things. They know that it gives little boys erections. Anybody who's had a parent or who was a parent for a little boy, you remember that first week, two weeks, two months, you change that diaper, and bing, he's got that little erection, right? <clears throat> Crazy. That, and this is why. It's because the mini puberty, that first week to two months, the boys are flooded with more testosterone, and they think that, A, it causes erection, it further masculinizes the brain, and uh, the researchers say long-term testicular functions and sperm production are regulated, whatever in the hell that means. So there's things that are going on. I think they're still finding out about this second flood. But then flood number three comes at puberty. And this is the one more people know about. But guess what? You know, what people think these days is that testosterone is related to some sort of aggression or violence. 
You know, they think that testosterone, according to Alan Alda, was, was poisoning men. You know, he's testosterone poisoned. So for 50 years or so, the researchers have been really struggling to connect testosterone with aggression and violence. And guess what? They've pretty much failed. What they found in the last 10 years is that testosterone is more a social hormone and it has to do with men's desire to strive for status. That's huge. That's absolutely huge. Men by nature with their testosterone are going to want to strive for status. They're going to want to become more and higher and higher in the hierarchy, right? They're going to want to do something really well. And this sometimes is hidden. You, know, you can't see it, but you know, some it can be money, more, more money. It can be um, power. It can be fame. It can be all kinds of things. But men tend to use their own niche to to want to strive for a status into. And you, you'll find, you know, the uh, academics they they strive for status by you know their, their journal articles. You know, the football players strive for status by the Pro Bowl. There's all kinds of different ways that men will strive for status. But that just goes throughout men, is this whole urge to strive for status. What do we hear from women? Oh, he always wants to win. God, it's so disgusting. Guess what, guys? It's in your blood. It's okay. You really want to compete. So striving for status. Testosterone increases the capacity to take risks. You know, you remember when you were a teenager, right? When testosterone hit 12 or 13 years old, you would take those risks, right? Oh, boy. Fear reduction. At the same time, it gives you this sense of taking risks. It also pushes you to have less fear. So can you see what's going on? We're striving for status. We'll take more risks. And our fear is reduced. Hmm. How about that? Threat vigilance. This is really interesting. One of the things they found out recently is that testosterone pushes this thing they call threat vigilance. And that is when a man's status is threatened, the status that he's striven for, right? When that is threatened, his testosterone tells him, hit back, fight back, don't just sit there. You know, so men have this thing inside that says when their status is questioned, they will try and prove themselves in one way or another. Threat vigilance, stress resilience. They found that inside testosterone is this stress resilience. It lowers stress for men, right? And they really need it because this is extremely stressful stuff. Now listen to what the researchers said. These studies have confirmed that an account of testosterone as a simple mediator of aggression falls short of the truth. Instead, testosterone appears to have a more subtle and complex role in driving behaviors that tend to increase an individual's motivation and ability to acquire and defend social status. Hmm. So men are flooded with this thing three times of testosterone that pushes them into a place where they want to strive for status. Hmm. And men have, what, 10 to 20 times as much testosterone as women? Well, one of the other things they found is that testosterone tends to lower our access to emotional tears. Isn't that interesting? Can you remember when you were 12 and you you suddenly thought, oh gosh, you know, I, I don't cry as much anymore. It's, what's wrong with me? Well, there's nothing wrong. It's because the testosterone is lowering it down. And they're also thinking now that testosterone is involved in basically muddying the emotions for men so they have a hard time articulating the emotions as they're feeling them. And that's a, a fascinating idea that you know, of course, the men for centuries, decade or millennia have been the ones on the perimeter to guard the perimeter. And so you don't want a man on the perimeter who's feeling something. You want him to be able to make that decision and pull the trigger. Anyway, testosterone. What increases your testosterone? You just think about competing and your testosterone goes up. Ha! <laughs> Interesting, right? Winning. When you win, look at these guys. When you win, you jump up in the air. Everything's up. Think about a football team. You know, when a football team scores a touchdown, it's all high fives up in the air. Yeah, 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 right? And the other team is looking down. Everything's down. They're pulled down. Gravity's pulling them down. You know, that's testosterone is pushing up. Lack of testosterone, because when you win, you get more testosterone. When you lose, not so much. Okay. Guess what? Ovulating women. Their scent 
increases your testosterone. The scent of women in general does not increase your testosterone, but when they're ovulating, oh yes it does. Testosterone turns off facial mimicry and trust when you're in the midst of competing. And facial mimicry is this thing that goes on consciously, unconsciously where, where people will mimic the other person's face in order to kind of create an empathic sort of connection there. And testosterone turns this off. And it also turns off the trust. You don't want to trust the person you're competing with while you're competing. You may trust them afterwards when you go out and have a beer, but while you're competing, testosterone turns that trust down. Isn't that fascinating? You know, for many people, when they see an angry face, they get fearful. But with people with large amounts of testosterone, an angry face means challenge, means I can do this, right? Interesting. Women's tears are lower. What did I mean by that? Oh, I know what I meant by that. You know, when women have tears, when women cry, it lowers men's testosterone. Think about that, guys. You know, you're in an argument with your spouse, right? You're back and forth, back and forth, all of a sudden, boom, she starts crying. What happens to you when she does that? One of the things we know now happens is that your testosterone goes down. Oh, God, it goes down. And guess what? That means you're probably going to, all those things, risk-taking, you know, all those things, strive for status, are going to go down. You're going to be more accepting, right? It's in your blood, guys. It's in your blood. Now, so we got this juice called testosterone, and now the scientists are starting to figure out something else. There's this thing called precarious man. And look at this guy hanging on this cliff, right? Does he look like he's struggling? No, he's smiling. Hmm. So what is this thing called precarious manhood? The status of men is often challenged. The status of women is not. Now, I want you to think about this. This is not a, a gray area. You know, before with the testosterone stuff and the brain stuff, that was kind of gray. This one's different. Men are, are often challenged, their status. Women are not. This is binary, okay? They've looked all around the world. They've found that all around the world, men are almost always challenged. Their status is challenged. Huh. And, and this is important because what does it do? It creates anxiety, for one. But let's go on. Manhood must be earned. Womanhood is ascribed. Do you get that? In other words, a guy's got to go out every day and earn this manhood. Manhood is tenuous. It can be lost and taken away. Womanhood cannot be. It's like once a woman, once a girl goes through puberty, she's considered to be a woman. Once a boy goes through puberty, he's still got to prove he's manly, right? This goes on all the time. Manhood is determined by others and requires public demonstrations of proof. Think about it. Manhood is determined by others and requires public demonstrations of proof. So men, each day, have to find ways to prove that they are indeed manly and are men. Women do not have this. Now think about it. Women don't have a clue of what it's like to be a man and to be in this, first, the fuel of testosterone, which then fuels him to be into this precarious manhood thing. This is interesting stuff, isn't it? Now listen to what the researchers say. Although we can only conjecture at this point, that's a researcher talking, right? We believe that many of the specific anxieties and behaviors associated with manhood and assessed with measures of gender role conflict arise because of the elusiveness and impermanence of manhood. You hear what they're saying? In other words, they're saying, hmm, you know, the way that men are, maybe it's because of this whole precarious manhood thing. Although we can only conjecture at this point, we believe that many of the specific anxieties and behaviors associated with manhood, in other words, manhood, arise because of the elusiveness and impermanence of manhood. In other words, men need to prove themselves, and this is why you see what you see. The precariousness of manhood, for example, can explain why men value status and achievement. Hmm. Precarious manhood explains why men value status and achievement. It explains displaying traits such as assertiveness and dominance. 
engage in risky and aggressive behaviors, avoid femininity in their appearance, personality, and conduct, and experience anxiety and stress when they fail to achieve cultural standards of masculinity. This is critical. This is critical. This is critical. Think about it. Think about the huge difference between the men who've got to prove themselves every stinking day and the women who really don't. They can't understand the anxiety. In fact, if you're a young man and you've got anxiety and you're not sure where it's coming from, eh -eh, this is probably a part of it. This is probably a part of it because you have to prove yourself. I mean, think about it. When you go in and you're uh, rated on something, you know, it's hard to relax, isn't it? But when you're not rated, you can kind of, ah, well, guys, you're rated every day. Every day you get rated. Now, what's interesting to me is the whole precarious manhood thing is really about the hierarchy. You know, we know that men live in a hierarchy, and this is what the researchers are starting to figure out. Hmm, men are, are questioned every day, and <laughs> they're just starting to understand, oh my gosh, men live in a hierarchy where we strive each day to go up a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, right? And... Everything men do oftentimes is related to hierarchy. Let's see. So testosterone fuels precarious manhood. Striving for status, lowering fear, increasing risk-taking, threat, vigilance, stress, resilience, all of that stuff is connected to how testosterone fuels this hierarchy or what they call precarious manhood. They'll figure out probably within the next three to five years that this is really the male hierarchy. So precarious manhood really equals hierarchy. Think about it. I mean, the men live in a hierarchy. If you go to masculine places, you know, the the stripes you wear on your on your um, shoulder or in, on your arm are where you are in that hierarchy. If you've got one more stripe than someone else, you can tell him what to do. If you've got one li less stripe than him, you better not tell him what to do. You know, so this is something men wear on their sleeve. You know, think about it. Sports games, all hierarchical. Sports statistics, oh my gosh. Hierarchical, hierarchical, hierarchical. I mean, you know, who's, who's got the ERA and the RBIs and the blah, blah, blah. And it's gotten more and more on base percentage. It's gotten more and more complicated. And as a man, I love sports statistics because it really puts things in order. I see, oh, he's first, he's second, he's third. This is hierarchy, guys. Stock market, same thing. Everything's hierarchy. Who's first, second, third? Up 0.02 today, down two thirds. Uh oh, the Dow closed it, blah, 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 right? It's all about hierarchy. Now, think about it. The precarious manhood folks are starting to understand how men really are. But the APA and the feminists talk about toxic masculinity. Hmm, are we seeing a connection here? Now, listen to what Jordan Peterson says about toxic masculinity. Peterson says, toxic masculinity is an attempt to smear masculinity by confusing masculine competence with tyranny. And this is what we see in spades when we look at precarious manhood and toxic masculinity. The feminists are trying to smear good masculinity by confusing it with tyranny. Now, let's look at this little guy here. Toxic masculinity versus precarious manhood. On one side, the R or the pink side, says men are toxic because, and the other side says, we understand that men will. And the first one says, men are toxic because they avoid feminine behaviors. The precarious manhood people say, we understand that men will avoid feminine behaviors. Huh, difference, right? Toxic masculinity says men are too competitive. Various manhood people say, we understand that men will be very competitive. Can you see the absolute craziness of this? The researchers are starting to understand that men are the way they are for good reasons. Toxic masculinity says, men are too dominant. The precarious manhood people say, men will move towards dominance. Toxic masculinity says, men are too status oriented. Precarious man put people say, Men will strive for status. Hmm. Toxic masculinity says men will take too many risks. They're too aggressive. Precarious manhood people say engage in risky and aggressive behaviors is something we expect men to do. Can you believe it? 
two very different views of men. But that's the good news. I mean, the bad news is that toxic masculinity people are out of their minds. The good news is we've got this precarious manhood piece that's starting to come up. It's starting to become, people are more and more aware of it, that really starts to understand the way men are. You know, and one more thing we can talk about um, before we go, and that is another little piece of testosterone. Another little piece of testosterone. And, you know, I've told you the research with testosterone has been just anemic, that it's been focused on uh, aggression and whatever, and very little research has been done on testosterone and emotions. So we don't know very much about it, although there's one um, study, a longitudinal study that looked at looked at emotions, the difference between men and women. They tried to tried to understand with MRIs and this is and that's how, what the experience was different between men and women and the way they emote. They couldn't figure out too much, but they came up with one fascinating idea. And that was that judging by their data, they were thinking that men, when they have an emotion, they see that as basically something that will help them understand where they need to uh, move to. In other words, it, it's a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A struggle, struggle. It, it's a, an, they determine what action to take based on the emotion. They use the emotion as a way to determine what they need to do, right? That's it. They use the emotion to determine what they need to do. Whereas men or women used emotions as just an experience. You've seen that before? The women will just experience the emotion. The men will kind of use, hmm, yeah, I need, to, I need to get that done. Interesting, right? Anyway, so one of the things we've had that really helps us understand testosterone are the trans men. And the trans men, this guy you see here, Max Valerio, and I, I did a video with Max and another trans man uh, about their experience, and, and that's on my YouTube channel. You might want to check that out. But uh, Max was a trans man, a biological woman, who took huge doses of testosterone and then became a trans man, right? And Max chronicled all this. Max was a journalist, and he he chronicled this. And what really interested me was he looked very closely at what happened to his emotions as this was going on. So let's look at some quotes from Max. I've noticed that when I'm emotional, it's more difficult to put my feelings into words. This is where women have a distinct advantage. I find it very hard now to explain or articulate my feelings when I'm actually in the throes of feeling them. You see what testosterone does? It garbles the emotions. Oh man, in therapy, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've seen it where the woman talks about her emotions and then she looks to her husband and she says, well, what are you feeling? And he goes, uh, 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 he's garbled. He can't, an hour or two later, he can kind of put it through, but testosterone impacts this. Now, some men have a lot of testosterone. Some men do not. So this is going to, it's a variable. And some women have more also. So this kind of thing may happen, will happen more with testosterone both in both men and women. Slowly I began to realize that if I had felt this way as female, I would have cried easily, released this pent-up sadness and frustration through tears. Now I can't. I find it impossible to weep. Max realizes that the testosterone has limited his emotional tears. Hmm. Not stopped him, but, but limited. I believed that men could cry just as much as women if they would just let themselves go. Men were victims of a masculine ethos that forbade tears that made them into unfeeling, seething septic tanks of repressed pain, ready to lash out. I was wrong. Max knows now that his assumptions about men and the way they were before he became a trans man, were wrong. He just got it completely wrong. Anyway, I think we're about out of time. So, um, testosterone and precarious manhood, two things that as men we really need to know about, we really need to honor that that's a part of us, and to know how much is in us of each of these things, and to be conscious and aware of them. Because by being conscious and aware of them, we're able to then impact those a little bit. You know, we can't impact them all, all together, but we can do conscious acts that may help us to navigate things and not be driven by the testosterone and the precarious manhood. Anyway, on that note, folks, men are good, and thank you very much.